Hello, everybody. We're going to get started today. My name is Katie Boone, and I'm the Marketing Manager for NSF ISR here at NSF International. Today we have a, a aerospace webinar for you guys. On uh, The topic is risk-based thinking for the AS91XX organization. Um, our presenter today is Don McFarland. Don is the Aerospace Technical Scheme Manager for the NSF ISR division here at NSF International. He has worked as a quality engineer, quality director, facility security officer, consultant, lead auditor, and auditing instructor in various aerospace, medical, and commercial goods manufacturing organizations. In addition to being an authenticated aerospace auditor, Mr. McFarland is a master IPC trainer for the IPC certification suite. He resides in northern Utah with his wife, Michaela, and their four children. Whenever you're ready, Don, you can go ahead and get started. Well, thank you, Katie. I love the wonderful uh, introduction there. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go through risk-based thinking for the AS9100, 9110, 9120 organizations. As Katie mentioned, I'm Don McFarland, um, the Technical Scheme Manager for NSF. I've got on the phone with me Mike McRandall, who is our Aerospace Business Unit Manager. Um, and Mike's going to be chiming in as needed, uh, correcting me as I go. So uh, bear with us here. Um, as usual, we're going to start off by going through our tr transition plan benchmarks. We'll go through some citations from the standard uh, regarding risks and opportunities. And then we'll talk about implementation. Um, after having been through a number of audits associated with upgrading different companies around the, the world to AS9100D, AS9120B, and 9110C, um, had opportunity to see various degrees of preparedness associated with their risk-based thinking processes and wanted to share some lessons learned associated with that. So that will get started uh, with the transition plan plan benchmarks. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, we've got one benchmark left for 2017, and that is on the CB that's on NSF. We have to ensure that we're communicating our uh, risk mitigation plan for any clients that have not transitioned. Um, we're going to be doing that with our accreditation partners here um, this next month in November um, with a due date of December 1st. Uh, that's just to make sure that the industry is keeping abreast of how the transition efforts are going through all the CBs. So every CB has to report on that, and then the accreditation bodies will uh, prepare reports and summaries associated with it for the uh, oversight teams. Uh, for 2018, as we know, there's really two dates that matter. One is self-imposed by NSF, and it's kind of an arbitrary line in the sand that we've drawn saying all audits uh, for upgrades should be done by June of 2018. And the reason for that is we need to ensure that we've allowed for any potential nonconformities to be closed, which is uh, up to 60 days associated with that. And then the CB has a review process that needs to be completed. Um, and we need enough time to do that prior to the, the hard line in the sand at this point, which is uh, September 15th. And that's the date that the current standards are canceled. And if you're not upgraded, you lose your certification. So we want to make sure that everybody's through the process, has been uh, able to close their corrective actions, and the uh, CB reviews have taken place well before that date so that we don't put anybody's certificate in, in jeopardy or at risk. Um, again, that's kind of the purpose for those risk mitigation plans, to make sure that we're addressing that and that we've got enough uh, resources and, and we've got our scheduling teams working around the clock to get that taken care of. So again, those are the key dates for 2018. We want to make sure everybody's kept up to speed on those. Um, at this point, there is no plan. Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is absolutely no plan to push the September 15th date out. Um, it's going to stay aligned with the ISO 9001-2015 uh, transition. So September 15, 2018 is a hard line in the sand, and there is currently no plan to push that out. So with that said, we'll move into risk citations. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why the change was needed. 
Um, as we know in the past, we had correction, corrective action, and preventive action all cited by the standard. So correction was always meant to be the putting out the fire, correcting the document, taking some action to restore conformity to the current issue. Um, whereas corrective action under the guise of the standard, under the, the nomenclature that the standard is presented, corrective action was always the investiga investigation of the cause and then eliminating that cause to prevent the, the uh, problem from happening again. Um, and preventive action was always intended to be investigating potential problems before they occur and preventing them from occurring. So where, where the common mistake was made is that companies would always take corrective action as a short-term action and preventive action as being the long-term solution to prevent it from coming back but as we know under the, the nomenclature of the standard, preventive action was a standalone activity that may have spun off from corrective action as we fed the problem or the failure mode across other processes, but it was really meant to be a, a standalone methodology associated with fixing things before they occurred. Um, it was definitely grossly misunderstood. And as a result, the committee, as they were writing the, the ISO 9001-2015 standard, decided to introduce a clarified concept, and they changed the nomenclature a bit to introduce risk-based thinking. As we know, that's kind of the, one of the form, formidable um, basis of the standard now. And in order to talk about what risk-based thinking is, I want to first go to ISO 9000, uh, specifically 9000 2015, and this is the uh, terminology or terms and definitions of document associated with the 9001 family of documents. And in here you'll see the definition of risk, and it says risk is the effect of uncertainty. Okay, it says note one tells us that it is an effect uh, an effect is a deviation from the expected positive or negative, although down here it says under note five, the word risk is sometimes used when there's a possibility of only negative consequences. So there may be a positive risk or a negative risk, but typically we only think of risks in terms of the negative consequences. One other item I want to highlight here is note three. It says risk is often char characterized by reference to potential events and consequences and it's often expressed in terms of combination of consequences of events and the likelihood of occurrence. So with that said, it's a little bit about what risk is. Let's talk about where it's cited within the standard. Um, as we can see from the beginning of AS 9100B, and this is clause 0 0.1, and you'll see the same references within 9120 and 9110 both, it says the potential benefit of an organization implementing the QMS based on this standard are addressing risks and opportunities associated with context and objectives. So by implementing a standard, or implementing this standard rather into the QMS, we have the opportunity to address risks and opportunities, really changing the focus from more of a reactive system to a preventive system. And while that doesn't sound like new language or new vernacular to you, it really isn't. It's just clarifying what was always intended. In fact, if we go to the next slide here, it says under the risk-based thinking section, this is again 9001 verbiage that's been included in the 9100D, 9110, and 9120 document. It says risk-based thinking is essential for achieving an effective QMS. The concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit in previous editions of the standard, for example, in carrying out preventive action to eliminate potential nonconformities, analyzing of nonconformities that do occur, and taking action to prevent recurrence that is appropriate for the effects of a nonconformity. So it speaks to both the preventive action and the corrective action side of the, the equation by addressing risks and potential risks associated with failure modes. Um, and then it talks a little bit about opportunities here. It says, opportunities can arise as a result of a situation favorable to achieving an intended result. For example, a set of circumstances that allow an organization to attract customers, 
develop new products or services, reduce waste, or improve productivity. Actions to address opportunities can also include consideration of associated risks. And risks, a risk is an effect of uncertainty as such. Uncertainty can have positive and negative effects. A positive deviation rising from risk can also provide an opportunity, but not all positive effects of risk result in opportunities. So essentially it's saying there's a direct linkage between risks and opportunities, but typically those opportunities are more things that we can do to expand our service offerings, to make ourselves more marketable to our customers, or, or to make them, uh, to improve our company's focus on them versus risks or things that are going to help us to improve based on the non-realization or the non-actualization of potential failure modes that may have occurred otherwise. So with that said, I'm going to skip forward to the standard, and we'll talk about the different clauses where risks and opportunities are discussed. And I, I got some, there's a method to my madness, so bear with me here. Um, but there's a lot of places where you see risks and or risks and opportunities mentioned within the standard. So the first citation here is under clause 441. It says the organization shall determine the processes needed for the QMS and their application throughout the organization and shall, there's a whole bunch of other um, sections here, but it, under letter F says we need to address the risks and opportunities as determined in accordance with the requirements of 6.1. So not only do we have to identify what our processes are, how those processes interact with each other and the sequence of those processes, along with the uh, methods for monitoring and where applicable measuring those processes, we have also have to identify risks and opportunities associated with them and make sure that we're addressing them in accordance with our own requirements. So from the very beginning, it tells us we have to identify risks and opportunities. And it really puts a process-based spin on it. Now under 511, it tells us that top management needs to demonstrate its commitment to the system by promoting the use of the process approach and risk-based thinking. So it tells us top management's responsible. And we all know that top management bears the burden of responsibility, but it's up to everyone within the organization to contribute to that. Top management sets the tone. They implement the system or they, they empower the implementation of the system but it really is up to the folks involved in the process to help ensure that we're moving in the right direction under the direct or excuse me, under the leadership of top management. Under 512, it talks to the customer focus aspect and says that top management shall demonstrate leadership and commitment with respect to customer focus by ensuring that, letter B, the risks and opportunities that can affect conformity of products and services and the ability to enhance customer satisfaction are determined and addressed. So again, top management is responsible to help ensure that customer focus is, is uh, that the direction has been implemented through the organization uh, with risks and opportunities in mind. We go to 611. This is the section dedicated to risks and opportunities, and it tells us that when planning for the QMS, the organization shall consider the issues referred to in 4.1, and that's the context of the organization where we are identifying the scope of the system, the not applicabilities of the system, the physical boundaries. So it's what we do, who we do, or excuse me, who we do it for, and what we don't do. And then we also understand the internal and external issues in our stakeholders. So we understand the needs of who we're doing it for, and we look at what could go wrong or what potentially could go wrong. Also, we look at what could we do better to ensure that our customers or our stakeholders are more satisfied with the type of work that we're doing. So uh, to the requirements referred to in 4.2 and determine the risks and opportunities that need to be addressed to give assurance to the QMS that it can achieve its intended results enhance desirable effects, prevent or reduce undesired effects, and achieve improvement. And then 612 is going to tell us how we do that. It says the organization shall plan actions to address these risks and opportunities, and we need to plan how to integrate and implement the actions into the QMS and evaluate the effectiveness of these actions. Actions taken to address risks and opportunities shall be proportionate to the potential impact 
on the conformity of products and services. I'm going to save my, my editorial comments associated with that for later because I've got a whole, a whole bunch to go through there. Um, but that, that's a pretty powerful statement saying that we're going to take proportionate, in, or proportionate effects based on the potential impact of the conformity of products and services. So it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all type approach as we see. Uh, note one, options to address risk can in include avoiding the risk or taking risk in order to pursue an opportunity, eliminating the source, changing the likelihood or occurrence, sharing the risk, or retaining risk by an informed decision. Um, you're going to see uh, under the AS section uh, in 8.1, it really talks to the same, the same concept. Um, and it really points to kind of an FMEA type approach, although there are several tools that we'll go through that can help to achieve that same type of approach. Under note two here, it says opportunities can lead to the adoption of new practices, launching new products, opening new markets, addressing new customers, building partnerships, using new technology and other desirable or viable possibilities to address the organization or its customer's needs. So again, once we understand our customers' needs, we un understand the context of our organization, we can work to identify the risks and the opportunities that will help us to be more competitive and more marketable towards that, towards achieving that. Um, you'll notice that we've now been in section four, five, six. There are some citations in seven, although for the, the speed of the presentation, I omitted them here. They weren't terribly relevant. It just says that we're assessing risks as we do certain activities there. Um, under 8.1, talks to the operational planning and control and says the organization shall establish, implement, and maintain a process to plan and control the temporary or permanent transfer of work to ensure the continuing conformity of work to requirements. The process shall ensure the work transfer impact and risks are managed. So as we transfer work from one company to another, we need to understand the risks or the potential risks associated with it. Um, another citation here is under operational risk. And I think this is where aerospace companies have excelled for years because we tend to do a great job of widget-based risk analysis. And we have this mandatory tool of a, a PPAP or a, a FEMA or something to that effect that's been flowed down by our customer um, to help us understand what those risks are. And if you don't have those flowed down but you've done them, great. If you haven't done them before, this is an opportunity for you to definitely consider it. Now the difference between Section 6 and Section 8 is 8 is a product realization section. So this is talking to the operational risks. And I'm not talking specifically to manufacturing, as it says down here in the note. Um, while Clause 1 addresses the risks and opportunities when planning for the QMS of the organization, scope, scope of Clause 8.1 1, 1 is limited to the risks associated with operational processes needed for the provision of products and services. So this includes design. This includes your contract review or your purchasing activities, or it could be your manufacturing operations, your nonconforming control. You're going to see more definition of what that entails uh, as we get into the auditor guidance material. And I have that here on a slide in just a few minutes. Um, but operational risk management is really geared towards understanding the risks for the realization activities. And typically, we see those uh, defined in a PFMEA or an FMEA, a DFMEA, and that's a failure mode and effects analysis uh, approach. And I'll talk to what that is if for those that don't understand it. But it's essentially evaluating the risks associated with your activity, your process, your product, categorizing them, uh, assigning a score uh, based on the likelihood or the consequences, and then identifying what we're going to do about it. In some cases, we're going to say that there's nothing that can be done or the cost of implementation or the cost of mitigation outweighs the expense associated with the potential risk. So we have the ability to accept the remaining risks after mitigation. Um, so that's really what this talks to. You'll, you've read this before because this is almost identical to the verbiage that was in the AS 9100C standard. Um, really not a lot's changed with that. We've, we've 
kind of led the focus of this section into the AS, uh, excuse me, into the realization activity, and then the risk-based thinking introduction and the risks and opportunities section in six, uh, section six has really helped to broaden the focus of risk analysis and risk management to other facets of our business. So with that said, we're going to go through a couple more citations under the realization section under 841. Uh, the organization shall identify and select, or excuse me, identify and manage risks associated with the external provision of processes, products and services, as well as the selection and use of external providers. So as we engage with those suppliers or external providers now, we're going to ensure that we understand the risks associated with their business. And those risks could be you know, their, their capabilities. It could be the, the industry's capability or the limitations. It could be something as simple as the geographical location and the, you know, proximity to uh, uh, severe weather or something to that effect. All of these risks could have an impact on your ability to deliver some widget to your customer or a service to your customer. So those are things that should be considered. Um, additionally, under the realization section, some I fast forwarding to your slides here. Interesting. There's a few other citations here. It looks like I omitted them or the slides got rearranged, but um, there's a few other citations where it talks to that same type of approach. We need to understand the risks for the business. And you know, design has it cited all throughout. Uh, counterfeit mitigation, counterfeit product, it's risk mitigation, uh, making sure that we don't potentially impact introduce um, counterfeit or potentially counterfeit or suspect unapproved parts into the value stream. I mean, these are all methods, these are all tools associated with operational risk mitigation. They just come, have come under a new nomenclature um, because it's a more widely accepted nomenclature within the industry. Um, going back to Section 9, now again, within the presentation, we've talked to 4, 5, 6, 8, 9. So you can see risk is really uh, introduced throughout the entirety of the standard. Um, and it's in the uh, introductions through that risk-based thinking approach as well. Um, under 913, the organization shall analyze and evaluate appropriate data and information arising from monitoring and measurement. The results of the analysis shall be used to evaluate uh, under letter E, the effectiveness of actions taken to address risks and opportunities. So we collect a lot of data through our system. We need to take that data and analyze it so that we understand the effectiveness of actions taken against the risks and opportunities and to really see if what we're doing is working. If at the end of the day our processes are being followed but we're doing the right thing. Again, we have tons of KPIs. We have process KPIs. We have product-based KPIs. We utilize that information to tell us whether or not we're mitigating the right risks or if we still have potential impact to our product realization processes or our service delivery, our customer-focused type activities based on the data that we've analyzed through this section. And then we can review that in the management review section under 932. 932 is specific to management review inputs. And it says that the management review shall be planned and carried out taking into consideration the effectiveness of the actions taken to address risks and opportunities and any new opportunities for improvement. That's not a new uh, statement than opportunities for improvement. And really what we saw under the previous standard was it discussed preventive actions. Um, as we know, preventive actions were, were misunderstood a little bit. But if we're doing them in their true form and we're understanding the risks and, and taking mitigating actions against those and addressing the opportunities for improvement, really nothing's changed since the 2008 version, but the expectations have definitely gone up because oftentimes that was misunderstood under the AS9100 um, C or the 9001-2008 version. Uh, Likewise, management review outputs also says that we want to take into consideration after looking at all that information, what additional risks exist? What other risks have been identified so that our management team, in particular top management who's been tasked with responsibility here, they have the ability to identify those and implement mitigating actions through additional risk analysis or through um, corrective action or some other tool. 
uh, or continual improvement. Speaking of corrective action, here's the uh, clause 10 citations associated with risk, and it tells us under corrective action, when a nonconformity occurs, including any arising from complaints, the organization shall update risks and opportunities determined during planning if necessary. So it's saying, hey, if you have a nonconformity, why not learn from that lesson and update that risks and opportunities for the risks, um, risk-based checklists or, or tool that you have to ensure that you're learning from your mistakes and not making the same ones over and over. It's a great concept. Um, I've also listed in here the AS9100 citations associated with risk-based thinking. And this is specific to the AS document. It says the concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit in previous editions of the, AS, or of the international standard through requirements for planning, review, and improvement. The international standard specifies requirements for the organization to understand its context and determine the risks as a basis for planning this represents the application of risk-based thinking to planning and implementing quality management system processes and will assist in determining the extent of the documented information. So if we understand the needs of our uh, stakeholders, our internal and external needs, or issues rather, and we implement a system that's addressing those needs and that really assessing and truly understanding the risks associated with that, we can build a system that's capable of meeting all of those needs. Um, we can ensure that we've got adequate documented information to convey what's necessary to ensure that we have repeatability in our processes and to be used in the training of our employees. Um, I want to read this statement here as well. It says, one of the key purposes of the QMS is to act as a preventive tool. Consequently, the international standard does not have a separate clause or subclause on preventive action. The concept of preventive action is expressed through the use of risk-based thinking in formulating the QMS requirements, and you can see it's now embedded throughout the standard. It's not something that's specific to one clause as it was before. They really want to put the focus on developing a risk-based thought model and implementing it across the entirety of your system, because that's really been the intent. Um, it did reduce, as it says here, did reduce the prescriptive requirements and the replacement of performance-based requirements. Now, I'm here to tell you, every company I've been to to do audits has done, in some form, preventive action. But what they struggled with is taking credit for that preventive action. And they didn't necessarily do a great job of keeping records to show that they had done it. And that's what I mean by taking credit. So oftentimes the preventive action uh, record requirements were pretty cumbersome. And oftentimes we only found one or two preventive actions throughout the course of the year because, let's face it, that's what we did to keep the auditor happy. And it only added value to avoid a nonconformity. When in reality, as a part of that initial tour as we were going through your facility, you were quite happy to show us all of the different changes that have been made, the Kaizen activities that have been executed, um, the continual improvement teams that have been done or implemented and created throughout the facility, and we only had one preventive action record. So now, instead of having a mandatory requirement associated with a cumbersome preventive action record, the standard said, do it, you still have to take credit for it, but the requirements for taking credit for it, the requirements for records, are not nearly as cumbersome as they were under the old standard. So, continuing on through the risk-based thinking section here, so not all processes of the QMS represent the same level of risk in terms of the organization's ability to meet the objectives. And the effect of uncertainty are not the same for all organizations. So we need to understand the risks, and then we need to analyze those risks and address them to meet the needs of our business, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It does go on to say, within the aviation, space, and defense industry, risk is expressed in a combination of severity and likelihood of having a potential negative impact to process, product, service, customer, or end user. So we typically have some methodology to rate the risks um, 
but it doesn't prescribe that we have to do an FMEA. In fact, the FMEAs traditionally have one more component, that's severity. So it's only telling, or excuse me, a detectability rather. Um, so it's only given us a partial look at the FMEA, the traditional FMEA type approach. And it's really just saying, do what makes sense for you, evaluate it based on your needs, and ensure that you're um, not going, no, you're not painting yourself into a corner. And I'll expand on that here in a minute. Um, says, uh, right here, the operational risk management process is supported by specific requirements throughout Clause 8 with the goal of developing an enhanced focus on understanding risk impacts on the operational processes and making decisions on those processes and actions to manage potential undesired effects. So if we can implement a process associated with mitigating those or managing the, the undesired effects throughout, um, we're definitely going to be uh, in the right direction as far as uh, conforming to the requirements of the standard, but more importantly, capitalizing on the benefits that the standard has to offer. So that's the, the boring stuff, all the citations. Now let's get into some of the implementation thoughts. And as far as this goes, I want to start with auditor guidance material. And this is a wonderful document that's been created by the IAQG and the uh, document reps more specifically as a means of telling auditors, and it's really focused towards the third-party auditors, but it's certainly available for use on the uh, internal audit side. But it's focused on going clause by clause and telling everybody what's expected, what should we consider, and what evidence should we be finding associated with each one of these clauses. So as we look at section 6.1.1, it says we should be considering the organization determination of risks and opportunities when planning for QMS arising from external and internal issues and requirements of relevant interested parties. So we talked to that already, but it's reaffirming where we're getting the information associated with defining risks and opportunities. We look to what we care about, and that's our relevant interested parties or our stakeholders, and the internal and external issues associated with our business. From there, it says the organization arrangements for addressing the identified risks and opportunities, including those that have an impact on the QMS achieving its intended results, the enhancing the undesirable effects, and you see examples of each one of those, preventing or reducing the undesired effects, and achieving improvement. So it tells us what we should expect to gain as a result of this. Now, under 612, it tells us again how to do it. So here's some more specific information. It says the organization arrangements for planning, or things to consider rather, include the organization's arrangements for planning actions to address the identified risks and opportunities to ensure that appropriate process controls are in place. And it speaks to ownership, documented information, instructions, methods, verification activities, process monitoring, performance measures, trends, training, competency. All of those things taken together help to articulate what um, control we have over our process and how we address and mitigate any risks. And it also serves as a great tool for us to drive the improvement or the opportunity if we find that we want to do something better and do it more consistently, um, we can utilize one of these tools as a means of, of formalizing that. Um, the second bullet here says integrating and implementing actions into the QMS, like capturing of lessons learned or sharing of good practices, benchmarking, process reviews, process updates, change control and communication, evaluating the effectiveness of actions taken, including through management review, effect on product and service conformity, achieving planned activities and planned results, monitoring of trends, effect of customer satisfactions, et cetera. The organization's approach to managing risks and opportunities needs to take into account the level of activity proportionate to the size and complexity of the organization. So it's not, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So the application of risk management techniques, including risk management planning, risk identification, likelihood or impact of occurrence, severity of outcomes, risk ownership, risk treatment, residual effect, continual monitoring, et cetera. 
And we'll talk to all of these here as we talk a little bit more about some of the tools. Um, taking advantage of new opportunities by building on current strengths or anticipating future needs, future trends, introducing new technology, developing new products and services, opening new markets or attracting new customers. And then under this note here, you'll see that it says there are many tools and methodologies associated with it, and they list a few of them here. Learning from the past, like lessons learned, using a pest or a pestle type approach, uh, SWOT analysis, FMEAs, business continuity or business um, continuity planning, and then bench or benchmarking. Um, we'll talk to some of these tools here as we get a little further along. The other section that I want to bring into it is 8.1.1. And this is, again, more specific to the realization activities. So the things to consider the organization arrangements for managing risks within operations includes the planning and control, project management, requirements for product and service, design and development, external provision. That's what speaking to the uh, suppliers or the external providers, right? Production and service provision. Should, they need to take into account the assignment of responsibilities, who's the risk owner, facilitators, champions, etc. What's our criteria for risk? Um, and this is criteria for evaluating how bad it is or how likely it is to occur or how, um, how likely are we to catch it. And then the, the risk activity, which if we go back to the standards, set, uh, says we don't want to identify it, we want to assess what we're going to do about it, we want to address it, we want to implement a mitigating action, and then we want to accept what we can't change or what doesn't make sense to change. Okay? So, these are the things that auditors should be looking for as we're evaluating these types of systems. Um, probably great for organizations to be looking at it from a similar approach. Hopefully you're not scratching your head too much at this point, but I want to go through some of the common tools that we've seen. Um, first is the SWOT analysis and the PESTL. Um, and for the PEST analysis, it's simply dropping the L and the E, the legal and the environmental aspect here. But really, a SWOT analysis is a great tool, and I'm sure a lot of you have used these in your careers to understand the strengths of your business, the weaknesses of your business. And you can also read those weaknesses as, as potential risks because these are things that we could be burned by. Our opportunities or things that we could get better at, things that we could expand our service offerings for. And then down into the threats, these are things that perhaps could also be considered risks and should be considered risks because these are things that could definitely burn us should our competitors become better than we are. Um, the PESTLE takes on a similar approach and format really doesn't matter. It's just looking at it from a different perspective uh, in the political, the economical, social, technological, legal, environmental factors. And you can see some examples of those different categorizations or, or things to consider associated with that. Um, obviously, if we're, we're dealing with international companies, currency, NAFTA, trade barriers, all of those things could play into it, and politics definitely becomes an issue or concern, right? Now, is there something that we can do as a company to mitigate that risk? Probably not, um, other than monitoring the political climate and, and really focusing on what we do well. Um, but perhaps it's a matter of opening a uh, domestic center so that we don't have to worry about distributing from a foreign country into another country. We can simply ship in, uh, between facilities and distribute from the domestic location. Um, these are all things to consider. Um, the FMEA type approach, and I'm showing you really two different varying degrees of FMEA or failure mode effects analysis. The one on the left is obviously a lot more complicated, and it has the identified risk detailed in this column here. And then you can see we've given a score associated with severity, the likelihood, and the risk factor. And then it, it becomes uh, weighted based on how we've scored for those two, those two uh, evaluation criteria. Um, there, like I told you before, we may also add a third one in here associated with how likely are we to catch it, um, the detectability. And all those factored together become a risk priority number 
and then we address risk priority numbers that are above a certain threshold. Um, and then on this particular format, they've listed the mitigating action. And then after that action, we reevaluated re to see did we make an impact. And if there is still a remaining risk, as indicated by this one, then perhaps there's something else we need to do. We need to go back to the drawing board, or we accept that risk and acknowledge that it exists. Um, over on the right hand side, you can see a much more simplistic version of it where we identify the risk, how likely is it to occur, how bad is it when it does occur, and what are we going to do about it. And really, all of these formats are perfectly acceptable, and it's completely based on the needs of your organization and your sophistication, if you will. Um, another tool that I've got listed here or shown here is a, this is called Risky Project Lite. Um, there's a Risky Project full version available as well for those that are really into risk analysis. You can, you can automate this through a, a database. Um, it's the same type of technology that exists in a simple Excel spreadsheet that I have listed over here on the right hand side. It just formalizes it a little bit more and captures the, the risks instead of populating them onto the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, again, lots of different techniques associated with this, but really what matters are picking the right tools. And as I've said down here at the bottom, there's no single perfect method associated with fixing risk or identifying risk. These are all tools. You need to choose the correct one or one, mm -hmm. plural, the correct tools associated with your business and your needs. So a couple of these would be category or capturing lessons learned, whether it be a matrix that identifies what's, what's, what we've done in the past or going to a more formalized methodology like TREES, the Theory of Inventive Problem Solving, where we use the lessons learned in other industries to help us understand how we fix our problem and um, ensure that it doesn't recur. Using a pest or a pestle type approach or a SWOT, um, implementing some sort of business continuity management or business continuity planning uh, document and ensuring that we're ready should something happen like severe weather, like a work stoppage, because um, those things are reality. They could happen at any time. Um, again, taking the SMEA type approach, whether it's a very formalized one or a more simplistic one that meets your needs, using that tool, uh, benchmarking off of yourselves or other trade organizations or your customers or other industry competitors even. You can look to see what that your competitors are doing well and hopefully uh, get enough information to help you improve as a result. Benchmarking is a wonderful tool. Some other tools I've got listed here, probably uh, more specialized, like the fault tree analysis or fishbone diagrams. HACCP is more on the food side, but it's a wonderful tool associated with uh, understanding your hazards and the critical control points. Um, and then you have some more simplistic ones, like employee suggestion programs. Um, I mean, if you think about it, that really is an opportunity for you to gather risks from the masses within your organization, from the people that are doing the work every day, understand what potentials exist and helping to mitigate them. And if you can and implement a system that works well with your company and your needs, um, you can gather a lot of really good input from the employees. Um, likewise, preventive action programs of yesteryear are perfectly fine as long as we address the um, risks and we have a methodology to ensure that we're feeding those risks into it and continually reevaluating them. Um, the standard, is, as we know, says we're going to use the context of the organization as a framework. And I've talked to that a little uh, fair amount already. It says we're going to identify the internal and external issues under Clause 4, and then we're going to understand the risks and opportunities associated with that. Now, as you see from this diagram here, that's part of the plan phase. As we implement our process, we're going to analyze the data associated with it, and then we're going to take appropriate action, and it's a vicious cycle because we're going to do it all again. And those risks and opportunities may change based on the actions that are taken down here. So we certainly want to be reevaluating, not just evaluating, but reevaluating our risks. Um, what, I, what I get 
I won't say frustrated, but what I what I don't appreciate is when companies identify risks and opportunities, and it becomes a very static document, something that's contained in the quality manual or their documentation, and it, it is very static. It doesn't change. I can guarantee that the risks associated with the business are changing constantly. They may be daily or even more frequently than that, and these are things that need to be evaluated. Now, to do a formal risk analysis on a daily basis is probably a bit much, but there's no reason we couldn't utilize some or more of these tools or some or, or all of these tools on a more frequent basis through different programs or processes in our organization to help us ensure that we're addressing risks in a uh, manner that, that encompasses a lot of these tools um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the last bullet I have here says we are, we are our own worst enemy through overcomplicating the process and or using this for compliance only. And that's really two ends of the extreme. We can make the process way too complicated such that it, it doesn't add value. It's just a checkbox. Or if we do it for just compliance, we do it for just the checkbox um, on the simplicity side, uh, we may be missing the boat as well. And what I mean by that is if I've got you know, five risks and opportunities identified on a static matrix that's reviewed once a year in the quality or the management review, um, I've met the checkbox. I've done what I, I am told to do, but it really doesn't meet the intent of the standard, and you're definitely not going to see the benefits from implementing a robust risk management process, like you would if you had these more dynamic methodologies for capturing risks and evaluating them throughout the course of the year and addressing them so that you can grow um, based on the prevention of those risks and implementing opportunities to ensure that you're meeting customer needs. Again, risks are dynamic. They change constantly. And then in fact, that slide or this picture is very applicable that the only thing that is constant is change. Risks need to be identified from all levels as we all see things in different in a different light. And they need to or they will change over time. So risk management processes or methodologies that have been implemented should allow for reevaluation of these as things do change because we want to make sure that we're not just capturing it as it was when we implemented the system, but we're continuing to monitor it and mitigate the appropriate risks based on what we're seeing today. If we fail to move forward, we're going to be passed by our competition. So some lessons learned here uh, from, from different audits, and these are bullets that, that I've just come up with off the top of my head here. Capture risks from different levels and review them for action. Make sure that you understand um, what needs to be done. Implement a mitigating action. Um, even if it's as simple as a spreadsheet that says, this is a potential problem, this is what we did about it, uh, make sure that you, you're addressing them. Um, also, on a similar note, if you are soliciting that input from employees. Feedback to the employee, if it's not being done, is probably a great idea. Otherwise, you're probably going to see a downturn in the number of solicit or the number of uh, uh, items that they're willing to suggest. So if you can explain to them that we're not doing this based on such and such, um, it may help to, to smooth things over so that they don't feel like they're, they're not being heard. Um, Establish a threshold for action. We don't need to act on every potential risk. I mean, there, there's, as weird as it sounds, there's a, a risk of a zombie apocalypse, I hate to say it, but the likelihood is very low, so am I going to spend a lot of money or time in, uh, in implementing a process for it? Absolutely not. Um, we don't need to spend a dollar to pick up a dime or to save a dime. That's where you guys need to make the decisions of what's applicable to your business, again, based on the internal and external issues of your business and the stakeholder needs or the needs of your interested parties, uh, ensuring that you're meeting customers' requirements. Okay? Um, the next bullet says, don't bite off more than you can chew, but follow your procedures if you have them defined. If you've defined a procedure, a documented procedure that says we're going to implement a, an action against all risks within 10 days, um, you have to implement it within 10 days. You're, you are your own worst enemy as that goes because the standard doesn't define that timeline. But um, 
you need to come up with a methodology associated with this. What I'm saying here is don't do too much or don't try to do too much because if you do, you'll become overwhelmed and you won't get any of it done. Um, the, the next bullet, review and reevaluate management reviews, production meetings, etc. There's a lot of forums, a lot of settings where these risks could be evaluated and not just on an annual basis. So if you're taking bite-sized chunks of these and addressing them at the relevant levels throughout the course of the year, because again, risks are dynamic and need to be addressed as such, it's probably going to be a better approach for you. Uh, given the number of places discussed in the standard, a sing singular approach to risk management is probably doing little to truly help you. Um, as we saw, the standard has risk addressed in nearly every section, and if we're only taking a one-faceted approach to risk, we're probably not getting the bang for our buck. It's going to be a dynamic process in getting to a level where it makes sense for your organization. It's not going to be something that you, you nail the first time, but implementing one or more of these tools is going to be beneficial for you uh, so that you're, you're utilizing the expertise of your teams and the, uh, capitalizing on the tools that are, are mentioned within the standard or implied within the standard. Last but not least, take credit for it. Be able to tell the story. Um, if you can't tell the story to either your third-party auditors, your customers, um, or your employees, uh, it's really all for naught. You need to be able to show what you've done so that you can take credit for it and help your customers to feel that customer focus or for your employees to understand why changes were made and what benefits there were. Um, one of the quotes that's really stuck with me throughout my life and, or through my career, and I, I know I've mentioned it a couple times with a group within these webinars, is to the important people we explain why. And you think about it, any change that's come down in your life, uh, if you were just told you're going to do this because, typically we don't react well to that versus if we're told why something has to change. We may not approve of it, but we understand why the change has to happen and we tend to internalize it and, and accept the change a little more readily. So if we can help to articulate why we're doing certain things to our employees and by having the evidence to be able to tell the story, it may help you to be able to tell that story to your auditors or to your interested parties, um, et cetera. So with that, that's the extent of the uh, discussion for today. I'm going to open it up for questions. If you have questions, please type them into that participant feedback section. Um, we'll get to those in just a moment. While we're waiting for those questions to pour in, I want to go over kind of the citations, if you will, for a lot of this information. And then I'll give Mike a brief minute to uh, see if he has any, any parting words of wisdom for us. Um, so with that, let me jump in or jump through these, uh, the bibliography portion. Some resources that were used in this, the ISO 31000 Risk Management Principles and Guidance. It's a great document associated with implementing a risk management process. The Supply Chain Risk Management Guide, is AS9134, another good document, but it's focused on the um, flow down of risk management to your supply chain. There's the evaluator, the audit, auditor guidance document, and that's available from the deployment support materials page that I'll show you in just a moment. Um, and then the Supply Chain Management Handbook has three wonderful documents associated with the implementation of a risk management program um, focused on not just the product realization piece, but also at the, uh, the operation, or excuse me, the uh, system risk level. Um, as far as the IAQG resources, they're available to you from the sae.org backslash IAQG page. We have the Supply Chain Management Handbook over here where you can grab those three documents. Or under the 9100 Deployment Support Materials, you can also get to it from here if you're interested in the other standards. Um, but the 9100 Deployment Support Material launching page is here, and it will take you to the uh, page where you can download that Auditor Guidance document or the Evaluator Guidance document. Um, again, wonderful document. If you haven't read it, I recommend you go take a look at it. Also, from the NSF side, we have a number of resources available at our transition page. 
you can see the address listed up here, nsf.org info ISO dash updates. And then if you go down to the 9100 page, you'll see this is where our webinars and our um, internal audit tool, transition guide, gap tool, all of those things reside on that document. Here's a brief summary of what those tools are. And again, if you have any additional needs or if you find something that you, you feel would be helpful to your organization, please let us know. Um, we're not sure, I'm not going to commit to, to doing it for everything, to, to addressing everything here, but if you give us some good feedback and we feel like it's something that's going to benefit a, a majority of the clients, we'll definitely provide that. Um, so we covered that. The last slide here is our contact information. On behalf of NSF, I want to say thank you and happy Halloween. Um, if you have any needs or questions, please feel free to email either Mike or me, and uh, we'll be sure to, to address those emails as they come in. Uh, Katie's going to be sending out the recorded session here soon, and again, it'll be available on our, uh, our transition landing page, our transition website page, uh, so you can go download it. If you're a glutton for punishment, you can listen to this, this webinar and again and again. So with that, I'm going to have Mike share a few words of wisdom, and then uh, we'll start answering some of these questions. Mike. Mike must have. Mike must have had to step away, so I apologize for that. Um, are there any? Questions? If there are, feel free to put them into the feedback section. And we'll start going through these. Uh, first one comes from Stephen. Says, "How do we address risk with product safety and deal with how the product can be hurt versus how our product could potentially hurt other users or others or users?" We are hearing more on than one school of thought on this. I'll tell you what, Stephen. Um, in this particular situation, I'm going to commit to doing that for the November webinar because I think that's another one that's grossly misunderstood. I know we've done something on the product safety piece already, um, but it didn't really address that aspect of it. And there's some further clarifications associated with it. So I will commit to that. In short, um, product safety is, is multifaceted and it, it approaches or it addresses both what do we do to prevent um, the product from becoming damaged by us doing it so that it causes harm to the employee, or excuse me, harm to the end users. Um, and then ensuring that our processes are such that it doesn't doesn't have a deleterious impact on it. So it's a lot of product conformity, it's a lot of product safety. Um, it doesn't necessarily touch the OSHA, you know, employee safety type piece of it, um, as much as some may lead you to believe, but uh, that's kind of the, the high level gist of it. Um, and again, I'll, I'll do that for the November topic, or address that for the November topic a little bit more. If you have further follow-up questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, next one comes from Richard. It says, with regard to using the FMEA for risk analysis and mitigation, are the failure modes usually identified on an organization level, process level, and or product level? Can you provide some examples? I couldn't quite see the content on the example slide. Um, so the, the example slide was simply just to show format. Answer the question, sir, it was more geared, or excuse me, the expectation here is that we implement it based on the needs of the organization. And it could be at the, uh, at the company level, it could be at the uh, process level, it could be at the product level. It's going to depend on their internal and external issues that are defined based on that context piece that we talked about. Um, personally, I think risks should not exist just at a high level because if we are leaving it or limiting it to that level only, we're missing a lot of potential opportunities for us to fix our processes and improve the lives of our employees, improve the lives of our customers through improved product conformity. So it really is a much more focused approach or a much more uh, multifaceted approach. Um, whether you use an SMEA to capture that or a spreadsheet or one of these other tools is really up to the needs of the organization. 
Um, the next one is how do we get a copy of the slides? And, and uh, as Katie mentioned, she'll be, or as I mentioned, and I think Katie mentioned it as well. We'll be sending out copies of the slides along with the uh, link to the video. You should be getting that here in the next couple or in the next week or so. Um, and the next question comes from my friend Jane up in Windsor. Some opportunity assessment is completed only at top management level. They will be able to explain and show objective evidence to the auditor, but this info is above my pay grade. How will you audit this? So as we know, on an annual basis, as we do our audits, we're supposed to speak with the top management officials of the organization. That's a great opportunity for us as auditors to be looking through the um, opportunities that have been implemented at the top management level. And one of the questions I like to ask my clients is, what keep, or excuse me, specifically to that top management interview is what keeps you up at night, um, and what are you doing about it? Because this is a great opportunity for the top management team to speak to what are the risks, you know, what keeps you up at night, and what are you doing about it, meaning the mitigating actions that have been implemented associated with that. Um, I don't think it's up to the, the management reps on the phone call. I don't think it's up to the management reps that are not listening or listening to the webinar, I don't think it's your responsibility to know all things about the organization. Um, this is where top management has been assigned a responsibility and they certainly need to be able to articulate it uh, at their level. But some of these risks are going to flow down into individual process owners or maybe product engineers, project managers, and they should be able to speak to the risks uh, and opportunities that have been defined for their levels. Um, the next question comes from Mark, says, how complex or in detail are auditors looking for in a recertification visit as it relates to risk? And Mark, I'll be brutally honest. We're looking for evidence of conformity. Um, I don't know that we're going to be looking for uh, evidence of the value add piece of this at this point. I think that's one of those continual improvement steps that's going to come over time as our understanding, collectively our understanding of risk analysis and the benefits of it improve. Um, but at this point, we're going to be looking for have you met the shall statements that were contained in the standard. And, um, you know, oftentimes we get it right. Sometimes the auditors, uh, we auditors don't get it right. And that's why there's an appeals process. Mike and I entertain those appeals. Um, we get a couple of months. We're happy to address them. If you have questions, reach out to us. If you want to file the formal appeal to a corrective action, um, we can handle that. Um, if you can't work it out with your auditor, that's the approach. If you can work with the auditor to understand what they're after or what they're, they're looking for, then um, that's probably the easier way to go about it. Um, but back to the original question, I don't, I don't know that we're going to be looking for you know, a complete system with um, you know, multifaceted approach at, at the recertification audit as much as something that you've implemented that's going to address the risks and opportunities as it relates to the context that you've identified the internal and external issues for your organization. Um, and then from there we can continually improve this. It's not something we're, we're all going to get right on the first pass um, because it's, it's relatively new to the standard as far as the, the verbiage of it and the vernacular of it. So. The concept isn't new, but definitely the way we, we look at it or evaluate it is, is new and evolving. So that's the last question I have at this point. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, gone. So on behalf of NSF, again, I want to say thank you to everybody that's paid attention, that's uh, attended. And again, our contact information is on the screen if you happen to have a question, please feel free to shoot us an email. We're happy to respond to those. Um, we get several throughout the course of the day. We usually get back to them pretty quickly. So um, happy Halloween. Stay safe and uh, enjoy your day. <laughs>